good evening or good afternoon if you're joining us from America. My name is Tanya Moore. I'm the Joyce and Michael Morris Chief Curator of Art at the Sainsbury Centre. Welcome to this Sainsbury Centre online event with Martina Droth and Paul Messier on the occasion of the ex exhibition Bill Brandt's Henry Moore at the Sainsbury Centre. The exhibition, developed by Yale Centre for British Art in partnership with the Hepworth Wakefield, provides new insight into the work of Henry Moore, an important figure in the Sainsbury Centre collections and his contemporary, the seminal photographer, Bill Brandt. This event brings together exhibition curator Martina Droth and her co-editor of the pub publication, Paul Messier, to share their research and reflections on the work of the artist. I'm delighted to introduce Martina Droth, Deputy Director and Chief Curator at Yale Centre for British Art, and Paul Messier, Director of the Lens Media Lab at the Yale Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. We'll hear from both speakers for about 40 minutes before opening up to a live in conversation where there's an opportunity for you to ask questions using the YouTube chat function. Good evening and welcome. I'm Martina Droth. I'm the Deputy Director and Chief Curator of the Yale Center for British Art, and I'm delighted to be here to tell you about the exhibition and the book, Bill Brandt, Henry Moore. And I'm Paul Messier. I co-edited the book with Martina. I'm a photograph conservator. I am the director of the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage at, at Yale and also um, lead its Lens Media Lab. So we're going to talk about the book and the exhibition, Bill Brandt Henry Moore, uh, which is at the Sainsbury Center before it comes to Yale in 2021, much delayed due to COVID-19. And I'll start by explaining some of the key ideas behind the project and what I hope will become apparent as Paul and I are talking is that the project deals with a historical narrative that is completely bound up with the physical materials. So the objects make up this, this history. And this is something we wanted to convey um, both in the exhibition, the experience of the object, how the particular ways in which we're displaying the works and also through the production of the book and its images. Um, and I'll now show you some, some images, most of which are drawn from the book. What you're looking at here is, is the cover of our book. Um, and I hope you can already see just from this image um, is that you know, we wanted to draw attention to the photograph as a physical object. And you can see the, the, the crinkles and the, and the hand marks, how this print was, was used and handled in its lifetime. And that's something we absolutely wanted to convey in the project. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. So we're dealing here with two very well-known artists and Henry Moore, of course, is almost a household name. And we're very used to seeing them treated individually and monographically, and also very much within their fields. In other words, we tend to encounter Bill Brandt in a fairly pure photography context, while Henry Moore's work, we tend to see it in the context of modernism or really just in the context of Henry Moore himself. And we also often see it separated by media. So books and exhibitions that focus only on the drawings or only the direct carvings, the tapestries, etc. So there's this, this constant division and subdivision of the work into parts. In this project, we wanted to break down some of those silos. Firstly, by looking at a wider range of works beyond those that we expect to see in an exhibition about these artists, and also by thinking about the historical context in which these works were seen and experienced and produced over time. And that brings us in particular to photography, photography as a reproducible medium and its role in the production of news media, magazines, books, the print culture, in other words. And of course, we already associate all of this with Bill Brandt, but we also wanted to show in this project that Henry Moore recognized and used these channels for distributing and making his work visible in ways that he could control. And it's worth noting that the Henry, the, at the Henry Moore Foundation in Perry Green, where um, Henry Moore studio and archives are preserved, the photographic archive alone comprises some 200,000 works. And they've really only barely begun to be explored and our project is really the tip of the iceberg. And yet, you know, it tells us something, how easily something so phenomenal in an artist's career can escape our attention, primarily because Henry Moore doesn't have the identity of photographer. So 
because of the way we tend to think about artists in these medium specific ways, Henry Moore's engagement with photography hasn't really been explored in the way that we might, that we might considering the, the size of that archive. Henry Moore and Bill Brandt first met in 1941 when Brandt visited um, Henry Moore and photographed him in his studio. And this was for a commission for the magazine Lilliput. I'm showing you an image here of, of, the, of the magazine. And Brandt invariably took photographs on commission. But we should also bear in mind that he was often very friendly with the magazine editors. Um, in the case um, of, of uh, Lilliput, it was Tom Hopkinson. So these commissions weren't pull, pulled out of thin air and Brandt certainly um, had the opportunity to assert his, his interest in, in the work that he made. The verso of this print is very interesting. And it tells you that this is the actual print that Bill Brandt made and produced in his dark room and sent to Lilliput for this very reproduction. So you can see here on, on the verso, the instructions to the, to the printer. And I'm mentioning this not just incidentally because it's a nice anecdote, but because it's materially important to getting to know Bill Brandt's practice. First of all, it shows us that Bill Brandt is printing the photograph with a view to how it will look on the printed page. So he's sort of thinking ahead. And secondly, um, and this is very important to understanding his, his oeuvre and, and, and what sort of drove him, Brandt invariably printed in order to publish. So the print was a means to an end and the printed page is the end product. And I think that's a point that we can easily forget when we think about the, the vintage print in isolation as some autonomous thing. What we wanted to show here is, is that these were working prints, a means to an end. So this portrait of Henry Moore prefaces um, a photo story in Lilliput um, showing Bill Brandt's photographs and Henry Moore's drawings of the London underground shelters, which they made independently of each other during the Blitz for the Ministry of Information. And in fact, this modest and cheaply printed article was really a key starting point for our project because it points to several of our important threads. The article is um, a very good example of the complicated status of photography in the mid 20th century especially during a time of war when photographs were so instrumental to reportage. The captions underneath the photographs make it clear or seem to make it clear who the great artist is here, it's Henry Moore. But um, Lilliput, unlike many other magazines, named its photographers, and here they're really showcasing Bill Brandt's work, and they're giving Brandt and Moore an equal billing in awareness of that sort of accepted secondary status of photography, they're putting that into question and, and pushing against that idea. So photography is what underpins the coming together of the two artists. Of course, it underpins Henry Moore's exponential fame, um, as well as um, Bill Brandt's career as a photographer. And we explore that throughout the stretch of their, their careers into the 1980s. In, um, in the exhibition and in the book, we look at the works that the artists created um, and, and their working processes, their way of distilling and concentrating their images. And this is a really, um, fabulous drawing by Henry Moore of 1940 called 18 Ideas for War Drawings. And it's an early response by Moore to the bombings and the blackout um, and shows him starting to think about how to, how to respond to what was happening around him. And um, I think that the way that these little vignettes are arranged neatly on this single sheet, it reminds me of the storyboard quality of some of the illustrated magazines or even of a contact sheet. So something like this, um, in the way that you know, images were arranged on a page um, to create juxtaposition. And here we see um, the way in which Bill Brandt's photographs were used to translate what was a very austere and um, dismal time, the blackout, into poetic opportunities. So we see Brandt and Moore, like other artists, responding both to the unfolding calamities and they were responding to a demand for certain kinds of images um, that represented and mediated the civilian experience at this time. So the, the context in which these works were made is a key part of the story. And it was important to us to include these magazine stories alongside and in a non-hierarchical way, other works of art. So not to separate them sort of from the 
so-called original works. Both of the artists referred back to their wartime work again and again into the 1980s. And each time they did so, a new kind of object was being produced. And I think this is where it becomes particularly important to think of the work not only in terms of images, but in terms of objects, because each, each iteration, each thing has its own qualities, its own patina. So on one side of the screen, I'm showing you um, the negative, Bill Brandt's negative from 1940 that he took in the Elephant and Castle tube station. This is now in the Imperial War Museum archive. This is the raw material. And you can see on the other side of the screen how Bill Brandt then transformed it into the kind of atmospheric images that we very much recognize as his style. And the page that I'm showing you is from a government magazine called Frontline, published in 1942, with um, uh, hundreds of images of what was happening on the front line and um, showcasing the, the, the resilience of the British people during the war. It was really a propaganda magazine. And what I found very interesting about this and, and, this, and seeing how Bill Brandt's image was used during the war um, by this government um, publication is that even though the Ministry of Information was controlling and censoring images and they were controlling the materials that a photographer like Bill Brandt had access to, they were controlling the printers, etc. We still see Bill Brandt making his own prints. So this is not something that was run off from the negative by a third party. It's, it's Bill Brandt's own print and we recognize it as such. So even at this time of restriction around images, Brandt very much was able to insist on creating his own aesthetic. Some 25 years later, we see an iteration from the same negative in Bill Brandt's photo book, Shadow of Light, published in 1966. Um, and I think this is a very interesting juxtaposition that he's making here of two, you know, very purposefully, um, a double page spread put together to create a very purposeful narrative. On the one, you, know, you can see the, the linear um, perspective going into the distance, the lines kind of connecting in the middle of the, um, the centerfold of, of the book. And um, I think he's sort of trying to create an experience of above and below. So the quiet streets, the blackout, um, the threat of the bombs above ground, um, and then civilians um, sheltering underground. So you can see that um, you know, he's revisiting his wartime work and putting it back together in a way that creates a narrative of the war and puts the photographer into the, into the middle of the scenes that were, that were unfolding. And later in the 1970s, as Bill Brandt was increasingly sought, sought after as an artist, he began printing large scale exhibition prints um, and so this is a, um, a spread from the book where we, we wanted to show the sort of life-size scale of, um, you know, what begins as a small negative that's blown up, becomes very grainy. Um, and he also becomes interested in this very sort of um, the sharp contrasts uh, without some of the modulations that you see uh, in some of the earlier prints. So um, in, in the book and in the exhibition, we wanted to show that photographs, even if they're based on the same image, on the same negative, they are individual and distinctive objects. So it was important to us that um, in the book, as a reader is leafing through the pages, that something of that experience of the different textures and the, the different ways in which these images, the, the same image looks um, and has its own qualities. So, so that the material qualities of the objects remain in play. And um, an interesting analogy can be made to the way in which um, Henry Moore worked on his, um, on his raw material. So we could maybe take this um, sketchbook page. This is from his famous shelter sketchbooks, which were um, later disassembled into individual prints. Um, and some of these he worked up into, into finished works that were then acquired by the Government War Artists Advisory Committee. So here you can see uh, that on the sketchbook page, he's drawn a grid um, only on one side of the page. So I sort of imagine just like Bill Brandt is focusing his enlarger um, to, to, to uh, to a particular part of the image, uh, Henry Moore is, is looking at his drawing and he's um, cropping the image for transfer to the enlarged page. So again, sort of a, a, distill, a distilling of the image to the, to the part that he felt was most impactful. And Henry was pretty meticulous. I mean, this is a very crude method of creating a grid and transferring things from one scale to another. Um, but it was very effective and Henry Moore was quite meticulous about copying and transferring these works onto the larger scale. 
and invariably use this, this grid system to remain fairly faithful to the, to the original work. Like Bill Brandt, he returned to these early works, and I'm showing you here um, on one side, um, a collar type made in 1967, which is part of a sort of deluxe edition um, produced by Marlborough Gallery, who represented um, Henry Moore and actually also represented Bill Brandt in the 70s. Um, and these are loose leaf reproductive prints after the sketchbook. And um, even though you know, we see them as, as derivatory and secondary now, they were quite sought after in the late 1960s and 1970s and were sent around on exhibition. And, and importantly, that 1967 edition that he made with Marlborough also contains a text that he wrote at the time, so many, many years later after the original event. And he, he remembers what happened how he first began um, making these shelter drawings. And it was really that text written all those years, that memory that Henry Moore had written all those years later, that then became part of the, the mythos um, and the biography of Henry Moore as a war artist. So, um, so that's also a role that this reproductive moment um, has in, in Henry Moore's career, that it's really when he, he solidifies that story and the narrative and you see it everywhere in, um, in the way in which Henry Moore's war work is written about. His own account is, is absolutely part of it. It's hard to really get the impact of scale from this image, um, but this is a, a tapestry I'm showing you, made in 1986. And um, Henry Moore had a series of tapestry made from earlier works, including um, shelter drawings. And you can see here that this is based not in, on the enlarged finished drawing that he made for the War Artist Advisory Committee, but he's going back to the original sketchbook page, massively scaled up and minutely replicating um, the original drawing down to the dotted line um, at the top of the, the, the perforation at the top of the sketchbook page. So we wanted to include these works because they really show the means by which the wartime work persisted and remained visible to this day. So it's not by some accident, but through this iterative process, the images never really went away. They were kept in the public eye by the artists. And also I think it's important to see um, the way in which these works trace a working practice over time. You know, this is what Henry Moore was making and engaging with in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And that's how Brandt's photographic style evolved. Sometimes, you know, our tendency is to go back to the, the original works, the vintage prints. Um, but there's a whole arc of the career here that, that's very interesting to explore. And that's um, something that we absolutely wanted to show in the, in the exhibition and the book. Let me now show you a few other sections of the book in the exhibition. So as, as you heard, we, we really begin with the wartime works, Britain at war, the blackout, the shelters, also the coal mining industry. And then um, we move into the post-war period and we leave behind the claustrophobic urban subjects, the people, the crowded spaces. And here we are in the, the, the empty, vast and pristine landscape punctuated by, by the monolith, this, these mysterious ancient sculptural shapes. And um, what you're looking at is, a, is the cover of Picture Post with Stonehenge, a famous photograph by, by Bill Brandt. And this issue um, published in April, 1947, as you can see, special issue on the crisis. It's about the winter crisis uh, at a time of um, fuel shortage and a, a deadly dire winter, which gave Bill Brandt his you know, poetic photographic opportunity, um, but was also a moment in time where um, you know, Stonehenge is captured in the midst of this snow, which was, which was so deadly for so many people. Um, and yet Stonehenge is the symbol of resilience. You know, Stonehenge is forever, Britain is forever. That's, that's the metaphor. And subsequently, of course, the photograph is freed from this specific context and it becomes more of a timeless image of Stonehenge in this, in this pristine landscape, this symbol of, um, of the ancient past, of the everlasting. So um, just to sort of remind you of, of the first slide that I showed you, um, our cover for the book really uses that picture post aesthetic, the header, the, the white on red, which we still associate with news today. Um, but then um, with, with these later prints of Stonehenge that Bill Brandt made sort of unmoored from that original context. And I think 
it's quite well known how Bill Brand and Henry Moore were both drawn to Stonehenge and some of the other great standing stones um, of Britain. And here you see, again, this is from Shadow of Light of 1966, um, where um, Bill Brand is creating a beautiful double page spread, you know, Stonehenge on one side, Avebury on the other. And he's also um, making an equation between the ancient stones, the ancient standing stones and modern British sculpture. And these two prints, which are in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, although the photographs were taken at different times, um, but the two prints we have in the exhibition were, uh, were printed at the same time. They're the same scale, um, the same kind of texture and finish. And, um, and, and it, tells, it tells us that what Bill Brandt wanted to do was really to make this equation between the ancient and, and the modern and to give modern sculpture um, uh, the language of ancient sculpture. And the, the sculpture on, on the right side of the screen is uh, a work by Barbara Hepworth. Um, Bill Brandt visited Hepworth uh, in her studio in 1956, and they clearly carted some of her sculptures down to the beach. And you have to imagine here that, um, you know, it, it, the, the work looks like as though it's rising up um, out of the ocean. And, and um, of course the base has been buried under the sand. And so it's, it's a very contrived image, but it's been um, set up in such a way as, as to create this sort of similar sense of mystery and timelessness as, as you get with the, the ancient stones that um, Bill Brand also photographed. And Henry Moore, like Bill Brandt, famously was drawn to Stonehenge um, and had long looked to these great standing stones as inspirations for his own sculpture. And there's um, the work on the far left of this screen from 1936. He, he wrote in a letter about it um, to, to Nash, uh, describing how he had um, you know, sought to, to create a sense of these sort of anthropomorphic standing, leaning figures of Stonehenge in his own work. In his drawings, and, and in this case, a collage work where um, he photographed one of his own sculptures and cut out the photograph and collaged it into this um, anonymous landscape. He's imagining how his own work would look, you know, monolithic against, um, against the landscape. Um, and then in the 1970s, he commissioned a photographer to take photographs of Stonehenge, although he visited there often. Um, he, he commissioned these photographs in order to make his Stonehenge um, series of lithographs. They're very, very beautiful. Um, but I think you can see and get a sense of how he's working from, from photographs rather than being on the site. And there's a, there's a very sort of strong photographic quality to these, to these incredible, powerful lithographs. Both artists were interested in the relationship between sculpture and photography, um, both in relation to their own work and um, and in the history of sculpture more broadly. How does a still image capture this dynamic dimensional experience that we have when we see sculpture in, in a physical space? And I'm showing you here a series of um, negatives that were never published. Um, Bill Brandt shot off these rolls of film while he was visiting Henry Moore to take his portrait um, um, in 1960. And he's photographing one of Henry Moore's sculptures on a rotating pedestal. So the, the pedestal is being turned for him and he's taking these pictures. And you can see that with each image, he's effectively creating a completely new work um, as, as the sculpture is turned. And we wanted to show how Henry Moore was very interested in these similar questions, how, how the photograph um, captures and, and changes the experience of the work. And here we see Henry Moore experimenting with um, different lighting conditions, different angles, with a work that he owned by Rodin. So he took it outside and put this big whiteboard behind it um, and, and documented it. So Bill Brandt photographed um, other sculptures. We've seen him photographed Henry, photograph the work of Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, and here we have Mayor. And he, is, uh, he took a whole series of photographs of this particular stone sculpture. And he was very interested in the way in which the material of the stone um, echoes the idea of, of flesh and, and the body. And in 1961, he published this article where he, he includes some of these photographs of Mayol that he took um, alongside his famous um, abstracted, fragmented uh, photographs of 
of the body of the female nude. So um, this, is, this is an article published in 1961 to mark and celebrate the publication of his book. It was a big year for Bill Brandt. He also had an exhibition at MoMA that focused on perspectives of nudes. Um, and this is really the moment when Bill Brandt begins to be thought of as having left his documentary photography behind, uh, which really is a, is a great simplification of his career um, and having moved into fine art photography. And these continue to be the works that I think uh, you know, are very sought after when we think of Bill Brandt as an artist. So we have a number of these um, nudes in the exhibition um, and um, in particular, the ones that he took on, on the beach where the body is, is kind of begins to be equated with natural phenomena that we see on the beach, pebbles and stones and cliffs and boulders. And Bill Brandt is also interested in photographing those stones. And I think here, you know, you know on the one hand, we see him um, turning the body almost into, into stone. And here we see him look for the anthropomorphic qualities of these natural forms. So he's looking at flints um, and, um, and these geological formations. And there's a series of um, color transparencies which we're um, including in the exhibition where you can see him really thinking about these actually small pieces of flint um, and make, presenting them as though they are these, these great monoliths rising from the landscape. And I'm sure you can see that there is a, a lot of affinity here with um, the work of Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth in the way he has set up these, these little um, natural forms in the landscape. And interestingly, as Bill Brandt is visiting these beaches and taking these pictures, he's also collecting shells, stones and rocks and taking them home and photographing them. So here, um, some of these, these pieces that he's, this flotsam that he's collected from the beach, he has set up on, on boards and photographed them. And sometimes um, they only existed as photographs, you know, they're dismantled. And sometimes he turned them into permanent works, into these um, reliefs or collages, which he then framed in perspex to hang on the wall. Um, and Bill Brandt was very invested in these, in these works and he showed them um, when he was still alive, when he was making them. But they've, they've kind of fallen out of, his, out of his earth. But we wanted to return them and to present them as part of the exhibition because they have such a resonance with the other work that he was making and also with, with the way in which Henry Moore worked. So Henry Moore incidentally visiting some of the same beaches uh, in East Sussex uh, was also picking up pieces of flint and shells and stones and bones, taking them back to the studio. And here we see him um, setting up these little pieces of stone in different positions using you know, plasticine to turn them from um, a torso to a reclining figure. And I think we can see just from these few photographs that this is where Henry Moore went back to look at these pictures and to, and to, to create his ideas for three-dimensional works straight from um, these pieces of found, uh, found objects. So in effect, he's making and unmaking dozens of sculptures in, in seconds and they, these forms only exist in these photographs. And he was also interested in the photographs themselves as raw material for new works. So we have included um, in the exhibition these um, incredibly powerful collages that he made. You can see him cutting up um, some of the photographs and piecing them back together to make bodies, very reminiscent, reminiscent of, his, of his sculptures. Um, and here are these, these, these two particular shapes, um, like barnacle-like shapes, form the, the breasts of this figure. Um, and in this case, they form the eye of this, this sort of um, skeletal animal head. So that's the end of my slideshow. Um, I hope it's given an idea of the, the range of materials that we've brought together and some of the synergies um, between these artists. But I'm going to hand over to Paul now to talk a little bit more in depth about how we approached um, the book. Thank you, Martina. That was a fantastic overview of the project. Um, for my part, as a, as a conservator of photographs, I'm really going to drill down to, to one aspect of the project, and that is conveying the materiality of the photographic prints 
um, both in the exhibition, a little bit in the exhibition, but mostly in print, mostly in the book. All right, so as, as I say, I'm going to be focusing on one aspect of the project, and um, that project is conveying the experience of a photographic print. Um, it's, it's quite obvious, right, that, a, that a, a sculpture, a Henry Moore sculpture, you encounter that in three dimensions. But people typically don't think of encountering photographs in three dimensions. They, they think of image, as Martina said, but they, tip, you know, often the idea of the photograph as object is, is subordinate. And again, as a, as a photograph conservator, someone who is heavily invested in the material history of the medium, um, we wanted to, I wanted to try to assert this materiality through, through, the, through the, the exhibition and the book. Um, and so how do you do that? Well, um, let's look at this photograph. This is a photograph by Bill Brandt. Um, a print. It exists in three dimensions, as, as, as you can see, and there's some, some cues engineered into this. Um, uh, there's the, the, the crinkles in the upper, upper right that Martina referred to, these crinkles. Those were important to us, these sort of haptic qualities, these haptic cues um, that are very common. And, and, and these crinkles relate to how the print was dried, perhaps, Bill Brandt's darkroom technique. There's a little bit of curl um, there's a shadow that kind of defines that curl. Um, and so th these are the, you know, these are sort of obvious kind of kind of attributes, but it's it's not typical in the way things are photographic papers are portrayed. And Bill Brandt and any photographer, serious photographer working in the mid-century through the 20s and 30s, would have been familiar with the language of the photographic print. And it's a little bit of that language that we wanted to, 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 to convey, and maybe to actually, in a way, um, revive. I mean, as, as we get in the 21st century, as we get further and further away from um, black and white photography, that language, I think, is somewhat being lost, right? And it's, and it's a language that would have been very important and very present in the lives of um, photographers in the mid-century. So let's look at that language a little bit. And one way to do it is to think about what were the materials available mid-century. This is a, a book by the Gewert Company. Gewert was a manufacturer of photographic materials from Belgium, um, one of the main companies supplying photographic papers in, in the middle of the um, 20th century. And we open up this book You see a number of photographic papers. The same image, the image is constant, obviously, but every paper is engineered differently. And, they're, and it's not arbitrary, right? I mean, if they're going to make this number of surfaces, each surface had a purpose. Each surface had different qualities. Um, each surface was specifically engineered for utilitarian purposes, but also aesthetic purposes. And so th if you think about this kind of as the, as the boundaries of the language, this book standing in for the boundaries of what was available, um, but think just to, to say, this is just one manufacturer in one year. There were multiple manufacturers. So there was this huge diversity of materials that photographers had access to, but also had to understand. Had to, they had to position themselves in this, in this universe, right? This universe of, of choice. And so breaking down some of those choices is, is something, that, um, it, it, something that I focus on. Um, and it helps me when I approach an artist like Bill Brandt, what can I read about Bill Brandt's intention from his prints relative to this universe of choice? We're gonna look at kind of two poles at the different ends 
of the of the spectrum, if you will. And so I've highlighted in blue this kind of cool um, white smooth surface in the upper right, and then on the in sort of the the lower right in green, um, a much warmer toned paper. Um, we're going to look at those papers a little bit more in detail, and this will give some idea of what I'm talking about in terms of the expressive dimensions of black and white printing. Um, if we think about the, the one in the upper right, that's, on, that's, that's a, it's called large X. It's on the left here um, in, in, uh, as an advertisement. It's an advertisement for large X. The one in the lower right on, is, is depicted here on the right. Um, and that was, that's a paper that uh, Gewert called Gevelux the lore. And like I said, they're on different poles, on different axes. And so what's going on with large X? Well, large X was a commercial paper. It was um, a very smooth surface, um, had a very glossy finish. It was very lightweight. And it was very, like you saw in that previous slide, it was very white. It was very like neutral white. And these are um, typical qualities when you want to convey kind of immediacy and, 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 and detail. For example, if you think about texture as an attribute, what does texture do to an image? Well, if it's a very smooth texture, um, the photographic image can render all of the detail that's captured in the negative. It's very sort of precise that. On the opposite side, we have this Gevelux velour with an incredibly rough texture, a broken up texture. And when you break up, when that texture fundamentally breaks up image, you start losing detail. And that can be a tremendous asset if you want to generalize a subject. Think about portrait photography, right? Nobody, no, nobody wants to see the way they look. <laughs> they want to see an idealized version of the way they look. They want those, you know, the small imperfections to smooth out. And so as a portrait photographer, you would be thinking about using the paper on the right, the Gevelux velour. That glyph in the middle, um, there's a sort of a blue diamond and this green, di green surround. These are the, the four expressive dimensions that I was talking about. Um, and one of the things that my lab does is put numbers around these attributes. All of these attributes can be measured and, and we can visualize these qualities. So here, what we've got is large X in the middle and um, imagine the four, four parts of that diamond, the four angles there. One of them is texture, one of them is gloss, one of them is color, base color, and the other is um, the thickness of the paper. Um, and, and you can see you know, these qualities, it's, it's very glossy, it's very thin, it's very neutral white, um, and it's got this super smooth texture. That diamond is kind of small, concentrated in the center of the glyph. If we think about Gevelux velour, it expands the, it fills the glyph essentially, right? So it's got this, it's, it's a highly, what I would call a highly expressive paper. And you see this in the advertising, you see this in the semantics and the word choice and even in the image choice of this advertising. So for the Gevelux Velour, you know, it's your best summer pictorial prints. It's talking about you, you as a photographer, your aspiration to be an artist, to express yourself through your photography. So your best prints will look their best um, printed on Gevelux Velour. It's the most beautiful paper ever made. And it's talking about, um, you know, a perfect interpretation of your art in the, in the finer print down below. So this is for art making on the right. On the left is more utilitarian. The faster they come, the better you like it, right? And so it's got two things going on in that image, which I think are sort of fascinating. One, these children coming down the slides, the slide really rapidly, one after another, right? And that's because this was sold to photo finishers. 
that needed to make prints one after another, after another, after another, and do it consistently. The second part of that image, what it conveys, is also sort of important and very telling, which is it's for amateurs. It's for, it's for people who aren't really thinking about photographs as expression, but more photographs as a reflection of their, of their reality, a, 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 as information to make a keepsake of your weekend at the beach <laughs> or, or the family party, the birthday, something like that. Um, you're not necessarily trying to interpret that you're trying to record that. And these are papers meant to record. And so if you, you, you sort of unpack some of these semantics and we can, you know, there, there are two, you know, again, there's, there's, a, there's a huge middle ground between these two poles, right? But um, here, are the, here are sort of the two poles. If you look at a lot of the advertising from the period, you start seeing these, this, this, the split in the language and the split in the papers, right? And so on the left, you know, with these smooth textures that we were talking about how smooth texture really reflects detail, reflects reality. It's using the camera essentially as a recording device and projecting a reality. So these are papers if you want to project um, an objective, uh, uh, if you want to project objectivity when you're looking at, at, at the world around you. You're not interpreting, right? On the other side is subjective, but it's clearly interpreting. Um, so you have real, <laughs> you're projecting the quality of, of real versus imagined, you know, functional utilitarian versus art, truth versus fiction, right? Immediacy versus kind of sort of this more eternal, you know, this sort of more eternal temporal quality. So these are all like these, um, this is the, the, the semantic loading really of photographic paper. And kind of bringing it home to Brandt, Brandt was very much on the, the left side of the screen. He, he, his papers, um, especially mid-century, the 20s, 30s, 40s, maybe up until the, to the 70s for sure, He's very much using um, kind of these utilitarian papers, and for really good reason, you know. Um, like Martina said, he was thinking of the print as a um, often as an intermediate step to ink on paper, right? And so that's that's clearly a utilitarian function right there. Why invest? And in, by the way, not only was the Gewert Gibelux paper, the, you know, so-called by their own, you know, description, the most beautiful paper. It was one of the most expensive photographic papers ever made. And we would never choose that paper if the final conception was ink on paper, right? Why, why would you do that? Um, but also there's a, I think there's something else going on here too. And this is um, typical for kind of surrealist Photographers, you know, I'm thinking of, of, of well, photographers that kind of fit into a surrealist kind of category. I'm thinking of, of you know, Cortege at a certain point and Brassai, um, certainly Brandt. The, the tension of a surrealist photograph is this idea that it, the conceit really, is the idea that it is projecting something that is real. It is projected that image which could never exist or is highly distorted. You know, think of Brandt nudes, um, but, the, but it's real. And that projects through the paper, right? That's one of the attributes of the paper. It, it, he's, the conceit is I'm ref, reflecting something back to you that you could never see or you could never experience. Um, and so it's, there's, there's the tension there. And some of those images would, would, would fail if they were um, so highly wrought, you know, on a, on a sort of a, a, the Gabelux velour type paper, right? I mean, it just, that would look like, okay, you're making art with a capital A. It doesn't work, it falls flat. And you start to see 
Brandt in some of these later prints that he's making for Marlboro, specifically for exhibition purposes, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't fully go to the green side of the screen. You know, he doesn't fully, he doesn't fully commit to these art making papers, but he, the needle points, the needle shifts a little bit when he's working for Marlboro or not working for Marlboro, when Marlboro is representing him. The needle shifts a little bit to, away from these kind of more utilitarian objective info recording type papers to more art making papers. The gloss goes down and that's a functional thing too. Um, you know, no one wants a, a super glossy print on their wall because you get, you get glare and reflections. But again, sort of a more sort of um, uh, generalized projection of, of an image versus kind of this kind of more tension packed assertive, you know, this is reality when you know it's, it clearly can't be. So we wanted to, we wanted to bring these kind of qualities, this thought process, this, this, um, these strategies um, into both the exhibition and the book. And so from the exhibition, these, the, the experience of the print, it, we're really trying to stand out of the way, get out of the way as mediators. Um, so a, a lot of the, the, the prints won't have mats. You can see them edge to edge. You can see them as they actually are and not some sort of highly mediated, idealized um, state. And certainly in the book, we try to uh, aspire to that. And so getting back to Brandt and getting back to the, Brandt, to, to the book, how did we engineer this? You know, this, this, this um, to, to, to convey these qualities, um, we really needed to come up with a new, a new strategy. And so this being our end product, let's, let's deconstruct this a little bit. Um, it's really a composite image. And the first, the first image in our composite is the print edge to edge, no cropping, um, and, but photographed in a sort of a neutral sort of a copy stand kind of way. So light coming in, diffuse light coming in from left and right, and it really conveys the image. Um, it doesn't convey really material qualities, but this is, this is the image that we're, that we're capturing, the photographic image. The next layer um, that we're applying is really a gloss layer. We're talking about these four dimensions, right? You know, the, so gloss is, is a key one. Um, and so what we've done here is um, we're, we're making the print to the extent it can shine like a mirror. We're lighting it, <laughs> you know, the photographers that we're, we were working with um, to do this thought, you know, I think they must have thought we were, we were insane because we're lighting it exactly the wrong way. Um, uh, we're bouncing the light off the surface. But that gave us a layer of, of, um, that recorded the gloss of the print. And we were able to stack that layer onto the image layer, that previous layer. And by adjusting transparency of the gloss layer, we were able to dial in essentially our experience of the gloss of the print. And, the, and Martina and I, we were doing this Again, you know, the prints are materials, prints are experiences too. You know, they have this, there's a, there's a temporal element to this, how you experience a print. Martina and I were actually sitting side by side with the prints, each print, and talking about our experience of the print and then adjusting these, these layers to kind of meet what we thought um, uh, to, to, to kind of capture these performative aspects for us and, and have that image convey it um, on, the, on the computer screen and then ultimately in the book. So there's the gloss layer. And this, the, the next layer is, and I don't know if you can, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna toggle back and forth a little bit here. Notice on the left side, right? The next layer is a raking light image, this low light, low angle light coming in from the left that really captures across the plane, any sort of planar distortions and some texture. Now there's, like I said, there's not a lot of texture in a Bill Brandt print, um, you know, paper texture, 
But there are all of these clues about how the print kind of is moving through time. You know, these little dog years and these little creases and all of that, um, which, you know, I, I think are, again, sort of vital when it comes to understanding the print as an object, but also as an experience. And then the last thing was sort of maybe our most controversial thing, and I'm gonna to toggle that back and forth, which is this shadow that really um, almost gives sort of a trompe l'oeil effect. Now that shadow is, is actually um, something that is based on the raking light image, but it's not the raking light shadow. It's something that one of the photographers um, basically fabricated. Um, now, again, if you think about it, we're mixing layers shot all different ways, all different angles. And the shadows for each of those, none of the shadows for any of those angles is, is consistent. Um, and, and none of them really conveys sort of kind of a unified uh, sense of the, the, the object. And so again, this, and, and to make them consistent in the book, one to another to another, we, we had to kind of distill down the raking light shadow um, and, 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 and put it in the background. And that's, that to us was maybe the biggest kind of conceit of the, the biggest uh, intervention, I think, when it comes to the creation of these images. But again, it was kind of an essential step to convey the, 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 the experience, our experience of these photographic prints. And if you compare a typical, a conventional depiction of a Bill Brandt image or any photographic image. You pick up any catalog of photographs, any photographer's book. Um, this is what you'll see on the left, typically, right? It's cropped, you know, the white borders are gone. Um, it's floating in this, you know, this white uh, infinity. And it's just the image, it's only the image. And again, it, it, it's, it's simply asserting that the only important aspect of this is the image. Compare that to what we've reproduced in the book on the right, um, and it's, it's very different. And I, and, I, and I wonder, and I still wonder, which is the bigger intervention? Which is the bigger, which is, which is the most extreme mediation? I, I kind of feel like the one on the left is the extreme mediation. This is where, you know, photo editors and designers and, and, and sometimes even the photographers themselves make the physical qualities of the print subordinate, entirely subordinate to the image. And on the right, this is, this is the way you would experience this print if it belonged to you. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting in terms of the, um, the reaction, I think, and, and we're still sort of, the jury, I think, is still out in terms of the reaction. For me, I think we're setting a new standard in the way photographs are, are reproduced. Um, and, and, a, and a lot of uh, collectors in particular have really reacted strongly in favor of kind of this version of the print on the right. Um, and, I, and I'm certainly hoping that this kind of um, awareness um, enhances, you know, your experience of the exhibition and certainly enhances um, your experience of the book. The book, is not some sort of derivative product of the exhibition. It's it's it, it, it's um, it's an experience uh, unto itself, and um, I think Martina and I are both extremely proud of well, both the exhibition and really 
the book in, in that it, it does push on some on some boundaries. Hello, we're delighted to be joined by Martina Droth and Paul Messier from America to take part in this live Q&A. Thank you, Martina and Paul, for those wonderful presentations. We're really delighted to have the exhibition at the Sainsbury Centre and the book is truly wonderful. And thank you everyone for joining this live part of the event where there's the opportunity to ask questions and we have about 20 minutes for this. Please submit your questions via the chat function on YouTube and you have to be logged on to your YouTube account to do this. So whilst those questions are coming in, I wondered if I could start with a question. Um, it's been fascinating to hear about how you um, worked on the project and how you captured the physical properties of the print for the book. So I wondered if you could talk some more about how you both collaborated together, how you came to the project and worked together on it. Hey Tanya, so good to see you and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm happy to start answering that question and then Paul, please chime in. Um, I had started thinking about this project um, just through looking uh, the, through the collections at the Yale Center for British Art, where we have some works that connect um, Bill Brandt and Henry Moore, uh, in particular the 1948 portrait. And I became interested to find out more about how these two artists were connected together. And I was particularly interested in their relationship during the Second World War. And um, by a stroke of luck, Paul Messier joined Yale around about the time when I started working on this project and somehow we got talking. Um, and then Paul really became instrumental to thinking about this relationship between the sculpture and the photographer um, and, you know, considering the different ways in which we could explore the material history of the objects that these two artists created together. And I, and I really think that by, by working together and, and thinking about our, the different perspectives that we brought, it made it a much richer project that took, that took us into directions that we hadn't necessarily anticipated. Yeah, so from my side, I mean, a, a stroke of luck um, pretty much sums it up. Um, this this is Martina's project. I mean, let's be clear about that. She, she conceived of this project. I, I came at a point when it was still in its formative stages, I think. And, um, uh, you know, Martina, her background is in sculpture, right? I mean, and, and my background as a conservator is, is in photography. So I think we had this really great, um, the beginnings of a really great relationship where we weren't really competing in terms of our, our deep kind of areas of subject matter expertise. And as a conservator um, of photographs, I mean, I'm very attuned to the to material histories and, and deriving meanings from materials. I've, I've also been working um, and, and, and Brandt is very present in his prints. You know, and, and when you look at a print front and back, you know, a, a brand and people really, I encourage them to, to, well, look at the book for sure, but go to the exhibition and really look at Brandt's prints. I mean, he's right there, um, which is not so common um, for a photographer, right? I mean, to be so physically present in the print. And so I was able to kind of draw some of these ideas out and, 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 and sort of walk um, th through how, things are made and how Brandt is present, how, how um, and, um, you know, that, that's, I, I think that added a, a, a dimension to the, to the project where, you know, we started thinking about the experience of objects and how do you, you know, what are the performative aspects of objects and how do you bring that out? So, um, yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a fantastic experience for me. And just to sort of, can I just add to what Paul just said to say that I feel, you know, for me as a, as a curator working directly with objects to find a, a solution by working with Paul on how to capture this sort of 
feeling and dimensionality of objects in the form of an exhibition catalog is something you know that that's always eluded me you know the pictures always get flattened and they become these illustrations of the objects and to have the opportunity by working together to think about how could we make this book more of an experience of you know the, the sort of privileged access that we as a curator and a conservator have to the original objects how can we preserve that in the pages of the book that was you know i thought that was really a sort of a a magical alchemy that we created by working together. Yeah, and we're never going to do I, it, right, Martina? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you absolutely did capture that experience. It really is a beautiful book. And related to that, we've had a question come through on the chat, a technical question. Are there issues in translating a black and white print into a CMYK image for printing? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you, you know, first of all, black and white, you know, it's so reductive. We think of black and white photography. There's no such thing as a black and white photograph. There's never been a black and white photograph ever made. I mean, there's all kinds, there's a huge range of, of image tone, base color tone, all of that. And uh, yeah, I mean, in, at the end, when, when we were printing the book, we went to extraordinary lengths um, in the, from the photography, but also the printing. And Martina and I were, were there together um, with master printers um, with, you know, a, decades of experience, you know, proofing each page one after another, after another. And, and some rolled right off the press, <laughs> but some, you know, we really struggle um, to, to kind of, again, as Martina says, you know, capture this, this experience that we wanted to. Um, we knew the by then we knew the photographs, the Brandt prints, you know, really, really well, and you know, individually, and so we knew that you know, this is this has got a warmer tone, this has got a cooler tone, this is this you know this is is looking okay in the center, but the edges where it's kind of warmed up as a product of age, that's not getting captured, that's not reading off the page, so yeah, a lot of well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and one thing we did during the sort of um, early proofing stages, uh, and this was only possible through the flexibility and generosity of the um, of the Bill Brand estate as one of the primary lenders of the um, of the of the show, that we were able to actually set the the printed proofs next to the original photographs um, to to compare and really try and make adjustments to present Bill Brandt's the, the tonal range, yeah, as Paul said, there was no such thing as black and white to, to really try and capture his, the original quality of, of the object as far as possible in the reproductions. And we've had a question from Rachel about Moore's photography. So um, thinking about photographs of ob as objects, um, did you find that his photographs were typically characterized as part of his archive rather than his artworks? And is this something that you wanted to address? It's a really great question. Um, Henry Moore's archive at the Henry Moore Foundation comprises some 200,000 works, which is quite astonishing and tells you something about his investment in the medium. And typically um, there are a large number of photographs that, that are arch archival, that are considered archival, such as um, records of his sculptures um, and um, various kinds of experiments that he made, some of which <clears throat> are illustrated in the, in the book and are in the exhibition. Um, but then he also used photographs as raw material for, um, for making new works. And there are these incredible collages which are on display in the exhibition. And those would then be typically characterized as, as artworks in the Henry Moore Foundation cataloging system. But a large number of works are archival pieces that Henry Moore didn't consider artworks. So, so there is a distinction, but I'm sure there's a very big gray area um, within those categorizations. But I think, you know, as, as I think the person who's asking the question is kind of alluding to, I think that the, by nature of being classified as archival, um, a lot of that work is uh, relatively uh, little known, you know, compared to Henry Moore's um, artworks or, you know, finished works on paper. So, so there's a huge number of, um, of items in that archive that 
um, are only just beginning to be explored. And, and our project is really just the, the tip of that iceberg. Yeah, and I'll say too that it's a it's a very fluid line um, between when it comes to photography between what is classified as as archival, supplementary, documentation, and a work of art, and it it changes all the time. Um, it, it, the sort of generational change has really been kind of understanding that there's no such thing as a documentary photograph and there's, um, you know, there's always a tremendous amount of subjective uh, 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 content, even in the most seemingly forensic looking image. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there was a reassessment of, of you know, Moore's photographic output. And I, I think we've kind of, uh, set the stage for that on, in some ways with 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 this project. Yeah. And seeing the photographs alongside the sculptures really shows them in a new way, which we're able to do in some points in the exhibition. So, um, you know, showing the head and ball sculpture alongside the photographs of it and mm -hmm. also showing the um, photograph of the chicken bone that became standing figure knife edge alongside the sculpture um, I think you read the sculpture completely differently um, mm. so yeah really incredible to to uncover those that material from the archive as well um, so we've had a quite a specific question about these the photograph of um, Hepworth sculpture on the beach so this is a Brandt photograph um, Martina, what year was that? 1956. And actually, if you go to the Tate's website, there's um, um, one of Barbara Hepworth's sort of photographic albums that she created of works that she was making. Um, a number of the, the photographs that Bill Brandt took of her sculptures um, are in this album, and it dates to 1956. And all of the works that Bill Brandt photographed were made around about that year. Um, something that I want to know is about how much creative exchange do you think there was between Brandt and Moore? So we know they met a number of times because we have a series of portraits by Moore, by Brandt of Moore and spanning a few decades. Um, and I know Henry Moore really controlled his image in photography with other photographers. How much do you think he did that with Brandt? And yeah, how much do you think they exchanged ideas and um, kind of creative yeah, kind of input? That was a great question, Tanya. Um, so the first photograph that Bill Brandt took of Henry Moore um, is the one um, that prefaces the little Lilliput article in 1941 of their shelter pictures. And it, it does seem to be the first time that they met. Um, and Bill Brandt traveled to Much Haddam to photograph Henry Moore in the, in the studio. Um, and he subsequently traveled um, to Much Haddam several times over the ensuing decades. And the last photograph that I found was um, 1974. So clearly they sort of maintained contact. There isn't really um, a lot of evidence of, um, of a sort of an ongoing dialogue or friendship, but certainly a, a professional and collegial relationship. And as I hope the exhibition um, shows, they were clearly looking at each other's work um, and, and clearly were interested in similar subjects and in similar problems. You know, the issue of how you, how you capture a three-dimensional object in a photograph is something that Henry Moore was thinking about in very creative ways. And that was sort of part of Bill Brandt's um, focus when he started photographing the nudes and he was also photographing sculptures. So this idea of the body in space. And I would imagine that um, if you look at, if you look across Bill Brandt's portrait uh, of, I mean, he was a great portrait photographer. It's sort of um, runs throughout his whole career. And I believe that he, you know, he truly knew what he wanted to do with a portrait. And they're very, you know, the, the portraits of Henry Moore are very Bill Brandt. <laughs> so I'm sure it was a collaboration between the two. Um, but I imagine that Bill Brandt, in, um, in his way of spending time with his subjects that he photographed, found a way of getting the Henry Moore that he wanted. 
I don't know if you want to add to that, Paul. Well, I just, you know, I, I agree with that um, wholeheartedly. I, I, I kind of feel like, um, you, you know, we've we've been working with this sort of relationship between Brandt and Moore. It's the essence of the project, right? And um, and and I don't know how much there was a, you know, a, a co uh, uh, artistic exchange between the two of them. I think they were sort of masters of their own. I think it's easy to think about more as sort of the dominant figure, right? And 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 therefore more is calling the shots. And maybe when they encounter each other, Brandt is sort of the junior partner or something like that. I, I don't think that's I don't think that's borne out in, in any of the work that we've done. I mean Brandt was was um he had a very clear, firm um uh sense of what he was trying to do um, when he was behind the camera. And he had strategies, you know, just even pre-war you know he's he's enlisting family members to to take roles in his his you know his set setting scenes um you know to if, if there's not enough squalor you know he'll he'll create some squalor by toppling over chairs and things like that um so yeah i mean brant is uh he's yeah he's not the junior partner um in this relationship by any means <laughs> We've had another question come through. So I know Moore was a prolific sketchbook keeper and did Brandt use notebooks and sketchbooks? Hmm. Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Um, in, in the same sort of sense of making drawings. So I'm, I'm not aware that he, that he did. Are you, Paul? No, you know, that's a great question. That is a great question, no. I, we would I, have to ask um, his grandson. Yeah, I would imagine yeah. that material would still exist if it exists at all, um, and it's worth worth pursuing. I would just make the analogy, and it's not exactly a sketchbook, but you know, when he started making his assemblages, I feel they're like sketches, except with physical material. So he collected all of this sort of flotsam from the beach, shells and algae and stones and bones. And he laid them out onto um, painted um, boards. And sometimes he stuck them down and turned them into sculptures, or sometimes he just laid them down, photographed them and reassembled them. So in a way, those are sketches, but in three dimensions. It's an interesting analogy. Um, I wondered if we could come back to Moore's photography. Um, you mentioned the vast quantities that there are in the Henry Moore Foundation archives. So he was obviously a prolific photographer. Um, how much do you think he knew about the photographic techniques and technologies, um, the types of which Paul has described in his presentation this evening? So I think he probably knew a lot. Um, Sebastiano Barassi, the chief curator at the Henry Moore Foundation, wrote a brilliant essay in the book on um, Henry Moore's photography and the different ways in which he used it. Um, and they're doing quite a lot of research at the Henry Moore Foundation. There are something like a dozen or more cameras that Henry Moore accumulated and used over the years. There are very sort of specific materials in the archive. For instance, um, there's a series of really beautiful glass plate negatives um, where he sort of took these time stop pictures of making a sculpture over over many years, over many months, recorded sort of step by step. And, um, and, and Paul mentioned to me that using that technology, using these large format glass plate slides, um, whenever it was in the late 40s, was already a little bit old fashioned. So, you know, I think, I think he probably was very deliberate and specific about the materials and technologies he used. And there are notebooks in the archive um, where, you know, he made, he photographed a sculpture from different angles using different f-stops, different lighting conditions, and he made notes and then thought about the effect that would have on the sculpture. And in the early publications um, of his work, uh, exhibition catalogs, for instance, you see that a lot of the photographs that were used were Henry Moore's pictures or pictures that he had either taken or had taken for him that he had overseen that are in the archive. So I think he was very invested in um, not only in the composition and visual aspects, but he was aware of how technique and different types of cameras would have a different effect on 
you know, getting the kinds of photographs you wanted. Mm. I think that's probably all the time we have for questions. So thank you so much to you both. It's been wonderful talking to you about the exhibition and your work on the book. Um, and thank you to Martina and Paul. Thank you to everyone behind the scenes who um, allowed this event to happen and to everyone at home for tuning in. So thank you. Thank you for having us, Tanya. It was so nice to connect with you and to talk about the show. I'm so sorry that we can't come and visit you right now in um, at the Sainsbury Centre, but good luck with the exhibition. Thank you.